Tonight's event is funded by the Sylvia and David Steiner Speaker Series, as well as the John Wells MFA Directing Fellowship. And I'm going to hand the mic to Miso Wei to introduce our guest. Miso is a professor of stage and production management in the School of Drama. Thank you. So I am also reading off my phone, although uh, Reagan and I uh, go all the way back to when we were in school together uh, talking about our unknown future, and now here we are uh, in the same uh, place to teach about uh, a lot of accessibility uh, work we are doing right now. So Reagan, she is an award-winning actor, director, filmmaker, writer, voiceover artist, educator, and an internationally recognized leader in an inclusive practice in the arts. She has been a, I'm going to pronounce this wrongly, tribalizer as a theater artist on wheels, wheels uh, performing at top theater from Broadway to Osaka, including Arena Stage, Manhattan Theater Club, uh, Oregon Shakespeare, Beer Festival, Mixed Blood Theater, Denver Center for the Performing Arts, La Jolla Playhouse, and The Family, among others. She frankly advised on accessibility and disability for project uh, spanning uh, entertainment business and social justice, and recently served as accessibility consultant on the immersive uh, David Bryan Project, Theater of the Mind. She's the co-director of the documentary we are about to watch. It's called Imperfect, uh, about disabled theater actors. And she spent five years as the artistic uh, director of the um, family theater company in Denver. So welcome, uh, Reagan. Then I'm going to invite her to, do you want to like, talk, to, talk to us and then give us an introduction? Oh, do you want an introduction? Sure. Well, hi, everybody. Thanks for being here. Um, yes, to everything Miso said. So this film, Imperfect, uh, came out of really a desire. I had been working at Family, which is a disability affirmative theater company in Denver that works with actors with all different types of disabilities. And I had been performing and working with them for a number of years um, and kept encountering people who didn't know about the company or had never seen anything like the company. And so I really just wanted to uh, put a story on film that could go further than Denver to say, here's what this is about. And we, I collaborated with my friend, uh, Brian Malone, who's the co-director, and we followed the process of Chicago the Musical while we were making it and following some of the actors in and out of the theater space. Um, so yeah, it has since gone on to 30 plus film festivals, I think. Right now it's um, actually playing at No Limits Hong Kong. Uh, it was recently at a film festival in Russia, which is a beautiful thing to think that artists can still you know, go across boundaries that pol politics can't. Um, it was at uh, Slam Dance Film Festival, Denver, Cleveland. Uh, I don't know, it's been all over the place. So uh, I hope you enjoy it and I'm happy to answer questions or chat about it at the end. Yeah, so I don't know if anybody has questions, thoughts, anything. Um, otherwise, I can just kind of tell you a little bit about the film and how it came to be, and then if that raises anything. But feel free to just jump in. Yeah. <laughs> Hi. Um, having done this and watched the film, are there things that you would have done differently if you were to start it again in terms of either setting up the process or how you, you know, structures of care or structures of support that you, like what are some of the lessons that you learned from it? Cause yeah. And from the production itself or from the filming or both? I think both. Yeah. But mostly the production. Yeah, well, so for the production, um, you know, Family Theater Company has a very established kind of set of uh, accessibility practices and such, um, but of course, like it, as you saw, we were in a different space that we weren't usually in, and that kind of threw us off a bit. Um, you know, so I, I mean, I think in terms of our supports, we did pretty well, but you always get into something and realize like, oh, maybe we didn't make enough space for people to articulate their needs in a certain way, or, so actually one of the interesting things that happened on this um, production was not around 
disability and accessibility needs necessarily, but around Chicago and some of the race representation in it, um, and some of the choices that I made around, uh, particularly the scene with Mama Morton in the uh, Prisoners and her song, where we were, you know, we were kind of, I was playing with um, the idea of uh, relationships between women when when you're in the uh, in a prison and trans transactions <laughs> that um, I learned later that there w was at least one member of the cast who felt uncomfortable with the way that it was handled and didn't feel like uh, they could uh, speak up about it and so that's something that I you know really reflected on and, and had conversations about and realized like, oh, I could have done, I thought because we were kind of taking this risk doing Chicago that was like this kind of edgier, edgier show for the company. And I was excited about like bringing, you know, sexuality into the mix and um, thinking about what that would mean. But therefore I kind of maybe didn't make as much space for, um, you know, having conversations around what that, I mean, well, I think I, I made co space for having conversations of where people were comfortable in certain aspects, but maybe not other aspects. Um, and then, you know, we were, I was excited about using a younger dramaturg who was trying to get experience, but I think that resulted in, you know, maybe some gaps in terms of having like conversations about race representation in the original script and such. So, um, so it's just funny, you know, when you're concentrating so much on like trying to, do right by everyone in certain ways, and then you have these spots where you're maybe missing things in other places, and you go look back and you think, of course, like that was so obvious, you know, why didn't I do that? So, um, and then in terms of the filming, you know, um, I, we were just kind of there. We tried to just be there. It was really, I mean, I was, as you can see, I was directing the show most of the time. So it was really my co director, Brian, who was kind of running around trying to gather footage as much as he could. And, and we didn't know, obviously, when we started the process, we knew something would happen, as it always does on a theater production. But we didn't know what, and we didn't know when or how or where. Um, so I think I would have just, you know, had we had more flexibility or any budget, um, we w I would have loved to have people there for more of the process because there was, you know, other there were other things that I think happened that we could have captured. Um, and then, in the end, it's just... I feel like we could make a documentary about every single person that's in this in this show, and um, so it's just you know, uh, if I could do it a different way or do more, then it would be like making this into a series kind of thing, you know, because there's so many other stories to tell. Uh, so it was really hard. One of the biggest challenges of the film was trying to narrow down, like which which stories are we going to cover and which aren't we. Um, so uh, so yeah, I think those are some of the. Some of the things. <laughs> yeah. Uh, yeah. So just kind of on a similar um, thread of like, if you had like all the time and the money and the budget in the world, like we're not, you know, thinking of the logistics side of things. But I think while watching this, it's made me think a lot about like, I don't know, the standards of theater that we have. And I was wondering like if you were able to have all the time and all the money and all the people that could help, like what have you dreamt about that you might like rethink like the way that we totally do things? Like lighting was a huge topic here. Like could you restructure like how you would do lighting or staging? And I don't know, it just made me really think about that. And I was wondering if you have any thoughts on that. Yeah, that's, thank you for that question. I love the ability to just dream. <laughs> um, I mean, I think the first thing, so all of the actors in family are paid, but they're not paid well, uh, like so many people in theater. <laughs> um, so I think the first thing would be like giving, providing a living wage for actors who are, are um, work with family and beyond. Um, you know, I think in terms of the accessibility, like, you know, family has a, a, a substantial budget for the show, but it's not, I, I mean, it's nowhere near, you know, like a regional theater budget. Um, and, and I think there are things like that 
could tap into the creativity. So like for this set, you know, we built ramps um, on various points of the stage. We have the railings everywhere so that hopefully blind and low vision actors can guide themselves. And But like the, the number of things that you could do if you had more budget, if you had elevators that you can build into the, you know, into the stage, if you had um, different ways of entering or yeah, different, um, ability to play with uh or to design you know we had we had dreamed about building a family theater um for a while while i was there and you know trying to make it like the most technologically advanced for like acoustics right so that you have that much more control over what you're designing as opposed to a big huge event room that you're kind of overhauling to work for a theatrical production um so i think they're just yeah a lot of those like technical advanced technical things that maybe we're finding elsewhere in theater, but um, that family itself just didn't, you know, doesn't have the, the capability to do. And then all the things that like could be invented that we haven't even thought of yet. And if we had the budget, you know, um, I mean, on any number of shows, you know, all of the designers who work on family productions are so creative and they come up with just like, you know, whether it's costuming or whether it's props and, you know, innovative things. And it's just like if they had more budget to see what they could do, I just can't even imagine. Um, so, and then, and then, you know, I think uh, for audience experience too, I mean, family incorporates a, a variety of accessibility options for audiences, but I think if we had even more options to, you know, have everybody everybody have a captioning device or i mean we we use uh, when i was there we used open captioning but um you know just to make that even more nuanced like where can you make it a more individual experience in terms of what sensory um what sensory uh input are, can people control on their own so that they can go to any production uh or any performance of the show and still feel like they can get like a kind of tailored experience in terms of what they're looking for um as well as just like being able to make all seating modular so people can sit wherever in the theater they want um so so yeah i think you know with the Ten million dollar budget uh, of some future show, <laughs> like that's what I would love to. There's a few things that I'd love to do, yeah. Yeah, I wanted to ask if you could expand on your interaction with designers, and also if if the designers are also people with disabilities, and also do you work with the same designers over time, and is there a development process and a learning process there? Yeah, uh, so when Family started out, it was essentially like just the performance roles were kind of designated for folks with disabilities. And, you know, part of the ethos of the company was like, yes, uh, you know, it, it grew from um, the, the five founders of Family were uh, folks with disabilities who were performers who wanted to perform. So I think they kind of came from that perspective and then thought, who else can we find to help us get this done? And But therefore, the ethos is largely like, yes, the onstage roles are, are kind of protected, for better, lack of a better term, for folks with disabilities. Um, but then it's folks with and without disabilities that are going to make it happen and that's and that's the way it also should be in that like hopefully I mean the the idea too is that we'll have designers come and work with us and hopefully they're taking what they learn back out into their other theaters so that if an actor with a disability comes to audition for a different theater they're like not spooked by it you know um that said over the years there's been more and more intention of trying to hire uh disabled designers disabled technicians disabled other artistic team members um you know while still realizing that you kind of need a, a mixture a lot of the time of folks with and without disabilities um and i do think you know it's interesting on this process um I was very, so also like choreographers, we'd been working with um, Debbie, who you saw, and Ronnie, uh, longtime choreographers with family. And I was really interested in bringing in like a couple of additional choreographers to start kind of training with them because it's such a unique experience that is different for, I mean, and I've worked with, uh, 
not just choreographers, but a number of designers, directors, and I, you know, one of the things family has always wrestled with is like how to onboard new folks to try to give them an idea of what it's going to be like. And there are multiple times that we've onboard or tried to onboard folks and then they get to the end of a process and they're like, oh, I had no idea what it was going to be. Like I thought I knew and, you know, um, so it's like how do you, so I, I was thinking like maybe an, a ment or an apprenticeship or kind of a shadow experience could um, help. Um, and then, I don't know, because of just different circumstances, we kind of ended up with like five choreographers on this production. Um, and that became like a whole other complex thing, you know. So it was, um, so I do think, you know, it's not... It's not rocket science. It's not brain surgery. Whatever the you know common tropes of comparison are, um, but it is very unique. That often, as I have talked about in a couple of classes while I've been here, it's it's more about um, you know designers or different members of the artistic team or members of the team in general being able to adapt and adjust like their vision. And particularly, I think particularly for directors who you know in the kind of traditional director. Uh, or, or mold of theater directors, it's about their vision and what they're bringing in. And I, I would try to kind of give directors a heads up that it's like, mm, we prioritize like the actors and the artists, you know, the other artists that are in the show, and you're gonna potentially need to adjust your vision around them to work with them. Um, or that we're all just kind of adjusting for each other and it's very interdependent and um, there's no hierarchy necessarily. And, and therefore, like as a director with the company, I largely see myself as a facilitator rather than like, I'm coming in and telling you how to do it. It's more, okay, we've got all these amazing artists. How do we make sure that I'm fostering communication so that all of them can like do their best work together? Um, and I think that's just a very different way of working from a lot of the ways that, uh, you know, designers and other artistic team members have, have worked in other places. Um, so yeah, I, I think I'm not sure what their, what the current practice is now at Family, but I think that was always a question of like, is there a way to onboard? But it feels like the, the best way to onboard is really just to kind of give people the experience where maybe they're not yet totally responsible for a particular role. Um, and I think then a lot of the designers we've worked with, like because it's such a different experience that is really more human centric, they come back over and over and over. You know, I think our costume designer on on Chicago was doing like seven other shows like throughout the the span, which is like crazy. Number one, you know, it's like what? It, like that's just a lot, you know, and getting paid very little for each of them. But she still was there and like did not want to drop family because she just loves the experience of it. Because um, I think it is you know, just a, a different energy um, on the production. So a lot of our a lot of our designers, and actually one of the um, young people who was here who I know had to leave for something else, but was one of our, our mentor lighting designers um, for a long time, which is awesome, um, and then going out into the world. So, uh, so yes, a lot of them do come back and want to work with the company um, over and over, as much as they can, given that we're also trying to get other folks in to have the experience. Yeah. First of all, I want to put into the space, thank you for making that, and thank you for sharing that, and thank you for taking the time to come. I think we all rushed a little quickly into the Q&A, and I just want to say thank you, and that was beautifully put together. And I'm glad I both attended your talk yesterday, and I'm here today to watch this. Which, on that note, I want to ask from a stage manager perspective, thinking about a normal timeline for a theater production, which, granted, there is no normal timeline ever, and every production is different in its own ways. Um, looking at what you shared with us today and seeing, for instance, the spacing rehearsals and taking more time than usual, I'm assuming, to walk through the set, mm -hmm. make sure everyone feels comfortable. What instances can you pinpoint or make a list of that would be important to consider for any stage manager in the future with any project of this kind? Yeah, great question. Um, so first of all, I think um, you know, one of the things we touched on a couple of, or yesterday, uh, is that, you know, time is one of the m most important assets that we have in theater, and it's also one of the 
things that's most important in accessibility. And so how you use your time. Um, I've been on a, a number of very professional theater shows at big regional theaters across the country. And everybody always talks about, oh, time, time, time. And then I've witnessed a lot of time being wasted, <laughs> you know, or just not used efficiently. So I think also, you know, excuses about, oh, well, we can't do that because we don't have enough time. We can't do a space that we can't give an hour for the actors to explore the space or for, you know, say the blind actors to come earlier to explore the stage when they don't have 20 other bodies walking around. I just don't. I, there's always a way. Um, it just might mean taking time away from somebody else that also wants that time, but that's where it's a negotiation. Um, but, you know, that said, family does one of the things that we've always built in or that we had always built in. I, I'm still speaking as though I'm there because I'm just, it's like once you're a part of it, it's like the mob, you're always a part of it. Um, or you can't get out. Um, but uh, but we would have a longer rehearsal process. Uh, so like Chicago, I think, was eight weeks of rehearsal and then over a weekend, a four weekend run. Um, and that's something that we've really kind of protected. Uh, and we don't necessarily get all, of, obviously, all of that time in the space. Um, but, you know, and that's that's built in for any number of reasons. It's because our actors with traumatic brain injury are, you know, trying to memorize lines and it works completely differently for them or, um, you know, having that space so that there's not stress because as soon as there's stress, then you're going to like cut corners and try to jump past something that's going to be really important in terms of making something safe and accessible and comfortable for people. Um, so, uh, so yeah, that long rehearsal process is something that we've tried to kind of um, keep as sacred uh, and then but you know still working efficiently and you know never I also we so I'm sorry another thing I should mention is that uh, most or a lot of the actors who are part of family the rehearsals take place at night and on the weekends because they're working or they're going to school uh, so it's usually like three to four hours and on weekday evenings and um, and then Saturdays for you know maybe six hours um, so it's already kind of in that it's you're not getting eight hour rehearsal days that you can and then we usually typically only do five hours or five days a week so that we can do a couple days to have a day off and then you know three days and we're very intentional about trying to build that time thoughtfully so we're usually the director or at least you know when I was there um, we would give them a general rehearsal schedule like up front that showed like all of the potential rehearsal days and then uh, before each week we'd have a full breakdown of specifics of rehearsal uh, specific calls all through the week so it wasn't just the night before that you're getting it partly because actors have to schedule transportation or um, they have to schedule their you know personal care needs and things like that around the schedule so you're working with a lot of that so time is very important but I think the more that you can you know front end your idea and then again it's like freedom within structure you build a really kind of solid structure for like this is what we're hoping the week is going to look like we're building in some contingency time with that and then um, you know we're we're being flexible within that but but uh, but also those expectations are one of the things that are most important for many of our actors are being able to say okay this is when I know I'm gonna have to be there later this week so that they can plan their energy their time their resources around that um, so yeah time is I would say one of the biggest aspects of accessibility If no one else has a question, I'll jump in and again and say um, thank you. And now I'm thinking about how there is little to no knowledge in the world about the multiple disabilities being presented on stage. And if you hold time during rehearsals to discuss that information, mm -hmm. and if you hold time um, with individual actors to discuss ways to better support them outside of rehearsal and how you go about that process specifically. Yes, so at the beginning of every process with family, typically the first day, you know, we would do what most other theater companies do. You know, you come, you gather, you um, do design presentations, you introduce yourselves, and, and typically like the introductions, we'd have a first like a kind of abbreviated introduction of obviously who they are and what role they're playing and such. And then later we would have a more extended introduction that would be really about like 
access needs and never never demanding everybody share, um, but encouraging folks to share what is gonna make them more successful in this space. And that's where people could say, well, hey, I have seizures, and if I start having a seizure, here's how you know the stage manager should be the one to come and help me. Don't worry about me; I'm going to be okay. Um, but you know, please keep your distance, or you know, and and it was amazing, especially for some of the new actors coming into family who would say, "I've never had this opportunity to share this anywhere I've been, much less in a theater," and like that that just from the moment of starting gave them that feeling of. Um, comfort and you know and often it was also like uh, particularly as somebody who has a disability I would try to model it and kind of share and be vulnerable in in introducing myself because I think a lot of people are you know you don't want to show up on the first day and be that actor who needs so much more than everybody else right but when everybody's sharing something that they need all of a sudden it's like oh wait we can relate over this rather than like feeling competitive and then that also helped you know one of the big things in family too is there are a number of volunteers that often help on productions behind the scenes um but I think that that level of like starting off from from a very early point of, um, you know, making your personal needs conspicuous and not hiding them, not feeling like you have to check them at the door, but you can actually put them out there, then also helps to build this very interdependent uh, company so that it's not always the stage manager helping. Often you have like buddies within the cast or just people, people are looking out for each other. And once you're once you know what somebody's dealing with, then a cast member can assist, you know, a fellow cast member with something that they may need um, or recognize that they're needing some help if they can't articulate it for themselves, um, as opposed to just, you know, just the stage management team always having to, to assist with that. Um, so, so, yeah, I mean, it just becomes a very kind of like organic, um, environment which you know is hard especially when you talk about like professional environments that have a lot of kind of um, structure built in about who can do what right but I think that's where I, I love family and I love you know even with those professional structures I think there is a way to still build the culture and the community of um, an experience to be like okay but we're not gonna like hesitate to just connect with each other and help each other um, based on union rules you know um, so yeah it's a really unique energy uh, that I don't I haven't uh, it's it's been rare to, for me to find something that's similar outside of family, but I have I have there have been other other um, companies that I've worked at where it's just a very kind of human centric, you know, um, supportive interdependent environment. So I think it's absolutely possible to build it into any any theatrical process. Thank you so much. <laughs>